Each spring, we Catholics enter a 40-day period of purification called Lent. During this time, we're encouraged to do three main things, fast, give alms, and pray. Lent is a demanding time, especially if we take it seriously, but most of us sell Lent short and fail to appreciate its benefits for ourselves, our relationships, and our faith. What if this Lent were different? What if you made a concrete commitment and strove for internal conversion? I'm Katie Asko, joined by Dom Purim, and you're listening to Know Your Faith, a podcast by Call to More. Join us as we step into the desert this Lent. So Dom, you're very welcome to the podcast. Great to be here. And today we're talking about Lent. So to start, we're going to look at the public perception of Lent. Now, most people know what Lent is and about one fifth of people practice it. In fact, according to an article on Vox, Lent can sometimes be more popular among people without faith than people with faith. Now, people tend to give up things like food and technology with boomers and millennials most likely to give up technology, according to research by Barna. So Dom, how how do you feel about this secularization of Lent? Well, in a way, it's not particularly surprising that, uh, let's say, in common culture, secular culture, Lent is really popular because there's this sense that, you know, we all want to improve ourselves. We all want to be the best we can be. And I was reading just the other day that Jack Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter, he gets up in the morning and he has an ice bath for an hour, <laughs> or maybe not, <laughs> a, well, a long ice bath, and he meditates. Um, at the start of every day, and he, he meditates again in the evening. Wow! And you describe that as being that's pretty that's pretty hardcore. Mm -hmm. So if he was a if he was a praying man, which I know he's not, you'd say, well, he's really praying hard. But it's different because it's really an effort at self improvement, being more efficient, being open to the options that the world kind of gives us. So Lent and this idea of fasting from things and giving them up. It makes sense to people in the world today because they're trying to they're trying to improve themselves. They may also be trying to encounter their true selves in some way that's not completely, uh, let's say, decided on. But they're trying to do something. And do you think that's a bit of a hangover from Christianity? Is it kind of harking back to their Christian roots without even knowing it? Because a lot of these things have been done for a long, long time, like veganism or even natural family planning, for example. Well, it's yeah, it, it kind of makes me laugh sometimes. I mean, my, I'm as a Catholic husband, you know, my, my wife and I have practiced NFP for years. And then you see an article in the uh, in, in, a, in a newspaper saying, oh, there's these people in San Francisco, they've decided to live this way, natural family plan. And he's like, well, you know, Catholics have been doing that for centuries, but yeah, okay, great. So there is a kind of a rediscovery of things which have existed and that through the church, the tradition of the church, which tradition is really learning from experience. So when you look at something which is a Catholic practice, it's really based on centuries of people doing something and also working it out. So it's not surprising that people would go back and say, oh, this thing is great, this Lent thing, you know, or this natural way of planning or living family life. This is way better than, you know, taking drugs to plan family or whatever it is. Sure. And that's almost the beauty, isn't it, of the 2,000-year-old nature of our church, that there's been so much time to figure things out and to figure out best practice in so many areas. Yeah. So, you know, St. John Henry Newman had this wonderful idea, which he developed a lot in the 19th century, the development of doctrine. So we, uh, we begin to understand better and better as time passes the realities of, of how God works, the nature of God, say, in, theological, uh, in a theological way. But also we, we understand better who we are as children of God and how we're created. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're constantly changing things. We're simply getting to understand them better. So when we talk about Lent, Lent is an ancient tradition. Like Lent is the great Lent, which is the Lent that leads up to Easter, the preparation for the, the resurrection of Christ. I mean, this was the most incredible moment in the church calendar. And then you had the second Easter, which is Pentecost which is 50 days after Lent. The Pente is 50 in Latin. So these great feasts, Lent is building up to these moments. So it's all going somewhere. Mm -hmm. And what is the Catholic perception of Lent? I guess if that's the worldly perception of Lent, how should we as Catholics be viewing Lent? Right, so Lent is not a life hack. <laughs> I think this is the this is the challenge for us. We don't, we're not trying to like become Superman. We're not trying to, you know, uh, lose weight uh, so that we can look good. 
uh, on the beach come summer. Mm -hmm. These are not these are not the goals. So if the world is trying to uh, create options, optionality, if they want to be able to be free from all these connections so that they can do stuff, we're actually trying uh, to follow God or we're trying to come closer to God. So we have this beautiful thing, this 40 day idea, you know, Jesus 40 days in the desert, Moses 40 days, 40 nights on Mount Sinai. There's 40 days for two of the evangelists in the gospels between Jesus' resurrection and his, his ascension into heaven. So 40 days, this, this wonderful time, Jesus spends it in the desert, in the wilderness. So we're, we're participating in something. We're entering into something of a spiritual life and a journey. I think Lent is this time to really, I almost look at it like a, a spiritual boot camp. So you take these 40 days and you try and build up some good habits and break down any bad habits that have crept in throughout the year. So really just to take, like, take advantage of this time that we have. That's right. We have this opportunity. And the church, the church has given us uh, this, this great gift of Lent and the feast that comes after it. But it's a, it's a chance to prepare yourself for, for, for Jesus Christ. So the, the Christ who is rising from the dead and comes to dwell in us. I love you know, we read that, that um, one of C.S. Lewis's books. He talks about you're like a house and God is tearing down walls and he's remodeling. He's building these new parts of the house. It's painful. Um, but actually, he's coming to dwell in the house himself. So that is where our Lent, where the Catholic Lent or the Lent where we, we understand the tradition of church teaches us. Um, is is a preparation for Christ, and in, in most particularly in the great celebration on the Easter Vigil and the Eucharist of the Easter Vigil, we're getting ourselves ready. And I think as well, it's important to look at where does Lent come from. We've already alluded to it a little bit, but as for the precursors to Lent, there was the forty days of Jesus in the desert, which is the most direct precursor to Lent, and uh, and we're in a sense trying to imitate him and what he did, although uh, a bit less impressive and, and extreme than forty Katie. days. I mean, in it's the yet desert. to be decided how much uh, you, you're. You, I think you're going to the desert for forty days, oh, aren't you? Yeah. Didn't you plan this? Book my flights. Yeah, it's it's all sorted. <laughs> Not quite. Uh, but also his 40 days in the desert reference the 40 years that the Israelites, Israelites wandered in the wilderness, as, as you already said. So yeah. what do you think we can take from that? How can we learn from their example? Obviously, they're very extreme examples and we don't exactly plan to follow them step by step or as, uh, yeah, like as extreme as they have. But how can we how can we learn from that? Well, it's interesting. I think man can survive for 40 days without food, just about, if he has water. <laughs> True. Locusts True. and honey or water. Um, well, look, Jesus is choosing to make himself vulnerable. Uh, this is the main, this wonderful, like, uh, thing that you can ponder. Like, he, at the beginning of his ministry, chooses this really, really vulnerable time. And this is where we, we encounter him as a, as a real human being. Uh, he was 100% human and 100% God, but he made himself vulnerable. And that's why we're we're modeling this because he makes himself vulnerable to the point of dying for us so he he was willing to take on true vulnerability um, so that he would rely completely on his father so complete reliance on the lord and when satan comes and tempts him he rebukes him and quotes from scripture uh, you know man does not live on bread alone but every word that comes from the mouth of god so we're going to face the same temptation so in a way we're making ourselves vulnerable so that we can choose more clearly for God. And it's actually a pretty profound thing. And as well, I think not just the, the history of Lent or the precursors to Lent, is there a way that man can know that we're supposed to have this time of purification? Because if you look at other religions, for example, Muslims do the period of Ramadan or the Jews used to have this very strong sense of purification. So they would wash their bodies and purify their bodies. Is there... In all of that, is there this very clear, innate sense that man has of needing purification? Well, th this is where the where we again we go, get into this idea of tradition, learning from experience. Yeah, I think all of us understand that it's good to have a day of rest, don't we, during the week? We also understand it's probably good to have a time during the year where you where you change the rhythm of life. So just from a physical or a, a mental perspective, if you just took uh, the work of God or the Holy Spirit out of everything, you could argue for this being just a, a sensible thing to do. And that gets back to secular Lent. You know, exactly, well, why people this makes sense. It. Yeah, yeah. Oh, let's all do this. More of them do it than we do. <laughs> <laughs> but it makes sense because God has created us this way. 
So he's, he's created us to be with him. There are going to be seasons, like we say, the Pentecost, the great feasting season. So where you're just really enjoying uh, your brothers and sisters in Christ and the, all the people that you, you share life with in the church. And I don't think the Catholic Church has any shortage of feast days. <laughs> no, remember, <laughs> we, feast, we feast a lot more than we fast. We do. We, do. Um, we, I mean, know, we, used, we, we probably used to, to fast a bit more. Yeah. Like, this is interesting, too. I mean, your parents, your grandparents, they would have fasted from midnight to the time when they attended uh, Sunday That's Eucharist. Right. Now, we only fast these days. The church instructs us to fast just for an hour before we receive the Lord in the Eucharist. And up until the Second Vatican, Vatican Council, I believe every person other than the elderly had to fast every single day of Lent. So there were very strict observances up until the Second Vatican Council. So that's only in the 60s. I mean, we really we really do have it quite easy. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Honest. We have it easy. And the thing is, though, it's this thing, this beautiful wisdom that we get from tradition again is the church, I think, I think has realized and has always understood that you don't try to put burdens on people uh, just for the sake of it. And that's where your own conscience comes into Lent. And so uh, the church understands that fasting is good and that, you know, the purification of our lives is actually a good thing. But it never, it's never the case that you're told these are exactly the things you can do. And these days, just you know, Ash Wednesday, Good Friday, these are the only official days of abstinence. But that doesn't mean in good conscience, you can't choose uh, to do things this night. So what are the practical aspects of Lent? What do we actually do during Lent? Well, um, Lent, you know, we're discussing Lent as this wonderful season where we're, we're intensely going into a period of preparation uh, to, be with, to be with the Lord. And that, that ultimate season comes to us in the Easter season, doesn't it? But first we go through this, this time in the desert with him. And practically speaking, when he, if you look at the Gospels, when when Jesus began speaking to us about, uh, he gets up on the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, um, blessed are the meek, blessed are the peacemakers. Soon after that, in Matthew 6, he starts giving us these, these three things. So prayer and almsgiving and fasting. And it's really fascinating because when he speaks about them, he says, well, when you pray, don't be a big loud mouth about it. <laughs> go, off and, <laughs> go off and pray in a, in a quiet place and do it in, do it in secret. Um, when you give alms, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. Don't, don't make a big song and dance about these things. And when you're fasting, you know, dress up nicely and don't let everyone know. <laughs> you know um, do, these things, do these things with a different kind of spirit to the way people might ordinarily do them. So that's really the three pillars. You might say prayer, almsgiving and fasting. And they're really powerful for us today because you know, we were talking before about, you know, people who do these really intense things. And I was mentioning, you know, the CEO of Twitter taking these ice baths and meditating and doing this stuff. A lot of people, when they do things now, they'll post it, won't they? They'll talk about it. Everything is out in the open. But we don't have very much um, interior life that we don't talk about. We don't, as a society or a culture, tend to go off into a room quietly by ourselves and do something uh, without, you know, posting it <laughs> you know, or <laughs> telling everyone, everyone <laughs> let everyone know oh you know it was great you know I even I, you know I even saw someone posting this picture a really good you know Christian guy he posted this picture up of oh this is my prayer time you know it was like it was a, a bible or you know liturgy of the hours or whatever it was and you're like that's great but actually that's not actually necessarily how God wanted, Jesus told us to do it right so it's a really fascinating uh, dynamic but these are the three pillars so you are supposed to have this interior life. And this is what Lent is really about. You're practically being invited to enter this interior life. And it's, it's beautiful in a way we learn from tradition. The church doesn't tell us exactly how to do these things. So there are things which, you know, you know there are days of abstinence. You know, you got your, uh, these days, it's just Ash Wednesday and Good Friday, right? right? Yeah. So we don't eat meat. And there are, in some 
some bishops' conferences, like in the UK, you you'd also don't eat meat on Friday. But in Ireland, I think you you can not eat meat yeah. or you can just kind of give up. There's different things you can give up or add in or, yeah. Yeah, so you can you can do some good stuff. Or you can <laughs> not eat meat. Uh-huh. Um, you can give these things up. But um, but ultimately, it's this uh, this idea this idea of of um, entering into this interior life, you're abstaining from certain things, and these three pillars, you're not told exactly how to do them, apart from these specifics that you are told to do, these specific fasts, you might say. So you get to choose in your own conscience how you do it, which is kind of cool. Mm-hmm. That is pretty cool. And I also think this was explained to me uh, quite well by a priest recently, how prayer, almsgiving, and I'm going to forget the third one. Fasting. Fasting, thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Been uh, writing about it all day. Um, How they link up with our three relationships, right? So with God, with others, and with ourselves. So the relationship with God is something that we can work on, obviously, through prayer. That's pretty obvious. Relationship with others can be worked on through almsgiving, so not being egotistical and actually helping others out. And then the third one, our relationship with ourselves can be purified by fasting. So by, again, ordering our desires in the right way and making sure that God comes first and uh, and then others and ourselves. Right. And so. it's, it's cool because... Um, we don't see these things. Like we were talking about secular Lent. Secular Lent is very, very different from, from Catholic Lent. And I think it's really worth us trying to understand that when you give alms or when you help someone out, like I was saying, like we like to make a big song and dance about things in the world. You know, fuck, oh, you know, we're a charity or a trust. You know, we've given this money to these people. Not all charities and trusts are like this. Don't get me wrong. But a lot of people, there's a big culture of, yeah, we're really proud to give. And that's, that's good. But actually... The Catholic understanding of giving is to share in the sufferings of someone else. It's not to solve all their problems. Like when Jesus walked the earth, um, he didn't say, round up 500,000 lepers and I'm going to zap them. You know, he didn't, he, didn't, <laughs> he didn't do that. He didn't say, okay, okay, today we're going to hit, you know, we're going to go to Capernaum. We're going to get uh, at least 25 people who've got serious, you know, disabilities and we're going to fix it. A lot of charities might talk that way uh, these days. But he didn't operate that way. He operated to the person who was who was right there in front of him. So there's all these moments where he's walking around. Son of David, have mercy on me. There's this guy, remember this guy shouting at him, shouting at him. And he's like, okay, what do you want? <laughs> you know? And he's like, your faith has set you free. He, he heals him. Or the woman just just trying to grab his, his cloak. And you imagine these people pressing around him. He was surrounded by problems like we are today. Like we've a huge homelessness problem. But you're not going to fix that, are you? I mean, I'm not saying all of us couldn't get together and do better. Mm-hmm. But but the job of almsgiving is not that you're going to fix this person's problem who's right in front of you. It's that you're going to share in their suffering. It's really, really cool. Yeah, and it's exactly what Jesus did, and we're called to imitate Jesus. So that makes that's sense. That's it. That's mm-hmm. it. And and he's not he's not trying to create this revolution. Mm-hmm. Um, he's actually trying to engage with the person. Exactly. So I guess... It's time to get somewhat more practical with Lent and talk about the actual things that people can give up oh, or no. add in. Oh, here we go. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so I've got to ask you the question, uh, what what do you plan on doing this Lent? And is it something you're going to do with your family, with yourself? How does that work in a family context especially? Well, so we talk about the three pillars of Lent and prayer, almsgiving and fasting. So uh, for me, I'm a family man. I've got five kids. They're quite small. So I'm trying to find a way for us to do things as a family. So one of our big pillars this Lent is a form of fast. We're going to give up all screens. Uh, We're going to turn off telly. We don't watch a huge amount, but we're going to turn it off completely. So nothing. And we're going to try to commit ourselves to some extra, this is extra prayer together. And that's just a very, very old fashioned way of looking at it. I'm, you don't turn off a screen though, just so that you can be, you know, this is not, again, this is not a life hack. I'm not trying to be Superman, I'm gonna I'm gonna reflect. Yes, yes, there's time for reflection. But actually the point of it is that I'm I'm hoping to pray. Um I'm hoping that by shutting something else off, it drives me to prayer. Then with fasting, um I'm gonna basically give up um uh, coffee, uh which is uh a bit of an unfortunate linchpin for me. Um I'm gonna give it up for Lent. And again, the point for it for me, and I'm only speaking for myself, is is to f- effectively be driven closer to, to the Lord. So that's the point of all this. We're trying to get closer to God. So when we give something up, when we suffer, um, 
we're imitating him in a way, but we're also leaning on him and allowing him to, to rebuild us. And that's, that's the nice thing. And then in terms of almsgiving, I am trying to uh, say a prayer, which is just a, a very simple prayer, which is, Lord, please use me. So I'm trying to enter into a, a period in this Lent that when, I, when someone asks of me, I'm going to say yes. Now, when you, but when you take something on, Casey, like the thing is, you have to be, like, I remember when I was, when I was 23, I, <laughs> I was telling you this earlier, <laughs> I gave up all meat. I ate only um, two collations a day, pretty much. You know, you have this idea of um, one big meal, two collations. Yeah. This is a, a very old, this is a way of doing it in the church. We've done it for uh, centuries, is on a, on a day of fast or Ash Wednesday, you would have one meal, two collations, no meat. I was doing that for the whole of Lent, and I wasn't even having a proper meal. And then I was going out for a run in the evening. And about 25 days into it, I started to get kind of sick. Well, so yeah, were you fainting or? I wasn't fainting, but I, I basically had gone too, I'd gone too far into it. And when I really looked at myself, I was like, and uh, let me just say, for those of, uh, those of you who know me, I know I don't look like I'm running every day, but there was a time. <laughs> There was a time when I was, I was, you know, single, let's say, <laughs> more time. It just, it, I realized I was doing it because I wanted to be Superman. And it was, I have to say this, what I think, the wrong, uh, the wrong approach. It was, it was silly. It was just me, it was pride. Mm. And pride's not the same thing as, as, uh, as, as piety. Um, and it's not necessarily virtuous. So you, you have to be wise. If you've got people you're responsible for, let's say, you, you're a boss over 10 people and you know that, uh, you know, denying yourself a lot of coffee is going to make you grumpy. So have, have a thought for those people. Or let's say, you know, you've got a lot of study to do and you're going to cut out all that uh, sugar and stuff. You know, be wise, you know, about what you give up. You can do extra. You don't have to do less. Mm -hmm. I can definitely relate in some in some senses as well. I mean, I, tr I remember last Lent I tried to do something called Fiat ninety, and uh, I oh, really I, know I really recommend it. It's kind of almost like the the women's version of Exodus ninety, and yeah, it was really good at the start, and I just totally trickled out of it. So there's definitely I think you really have to go into Lent very intentionally and really be honest with yourself and make sure that you're setting yourself up for for success and making sure that you're not binding off more than you can chew because it can be really easy uh, to lack that humility and lack that discernment and judgment of yourself going but you're, into Lent. But you're, you're the kind of person who I, I, have, I have an impression of you. If you, you started <laughs> something, you would do it. So you, yeah. you were, it was just a struggle. It was a well, lot. Well, I think I might have been doing it for other people. I was doing it with a group of people and I kind of had to do it. So yeah. I feel really bad if any of them are listening to this now. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I just don't think I'd really taken it on for myself. It wasn't a decision so much between me and Jesus as it was between me and other people. So I think that's really important before Lent to make sure that you really pray and discern and ask God, you know, what do you want me to get out of this Lent? What do you yeah, want me to do? Yeah, but that's such a good point. I mean, if, if the thing is, if if our lives aren't based in asking God for for guidance. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And our goal is to come closer to him. And if we're children of God, then he's the one who can really guide us. But I love the church's guidance on it too, Katie. It's so cool that um, we could enter into this season and actually make decisions around around this to come closer to God in our own lives and then share that with, with others. And those those movements like Fiat and Exodus 90 are so cool in a way because people could come together and support each other. But as you say, this has got to be something that you have uh, discerned and you've decided to do. Because if you haven't discerned it, it can become a huge burden. So not only did you fail to do the thing, but now you feel terrible. Yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> exactly. like, oh my gosh, you know, I can't even, I can't even do this. I can't even get through the rosary every day and, and you know, give up these things. I'm just a really bad Catholic. But that's not true. That's a lie. Mm -hmm. So you, you don't want to create these burdens for yourself. And so discernment and the advice of friends or spiritual directors too, that stuff is, uh, that stuff helps a lot. Yeah, definitely. And and just a note on Exodus 90 and Fiat 90, because uh, I don't want people to think I, I'm not supporting it. I absolutely think if you can do it and if you are doing it, definitely to 
you know, pray about it beforehand and make sure you're really committed yourself between you and God. Uh, but I really do encourage you to consider doing it. I know Exodus 90 has absolutely exploded. Almost every single Catholic guy I knew was doing it last year. Yeah, and I know there's time. follow on programs as well. So you can keep doing a similar thing. Uh, so they're really, really cool. We'll have links to them on our website. Um, but there's also there's Covenant Eyes as well. I know for, for anyone who struggles with pornography, if that's something you really want to tackle this Lent, you can sign up to Covenant Eyes. Um, there's also some really good resources on Focus's website. So all of this will be linking uh, to through our website. But Focus have something called Uncompromising Purity. So for any women struggling with purity, it's just a really good uh, roadmap on how to overcome that. And you know, those resources are a, a great start for, for an exploration because maybe you could say to yourself, well, I've got, I've got these things that I struggle with and maybe I've just kind of given up on them. And that's, that's something that I, I, you know, I've, I've spoken to a lot of people who, who struggle in lots of different ways. Um, uh, whether it's a struggle just to, to pray every day. I mean, we're all, we're all supposed to be praying every day. Maybe you don't do it. And so this is a chance for you to actually get started and put certain things in order. Um, is it just me or are there bells? <laughs> there are bells. You know what? We're Catholics and we're recording it's the Angelus. here at church. <laughs> it is the Angelus, actually. And uh, these things happen. But the point I was going to say, basically, you have a chance in Lent to have a good look at yourself as well. So are there things that you're really struggling with? Do you struggle to be generous? With the, do you say no a lot um, when maybe you could say yes? Um, do you help your parents out if you're living at home do you actually do things for them or do you just let them do everything for you um are, are you basically dealing with your anxiety just by going onto the phone it's a chance it you have to examine and have a look at yourself and this is your chance to do it and some other ideas that you could do for Lent as well you can carry around gift cards or vouchers for places like subway or even one for all gift cards, you can use them in Tesco. So you can be able to give those to people in need. So there's loads of different ideas that you can do. And when it comes to your relationship with God, there's literally no end. I mean, you can pray for 20 minutes a day. That's one thing that actually, again, in spiritual direction, I found really, really helpful. Um, and it's something that I took, took me a while to get my head around because he said to pray for 20 minutes every day, nothing more and nothing less. So to make this commitment between you and God, and even if you feel tempted to sit there and go on and on and on and in conversation with God, just to really, I guess, just keep it to 20 minutes because that's what's going to be consistent for you. And that's the commitment that you've made. So, But actually, uh, 20 minutes is a long time in prayer. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's, there's potential for, you know, those 20 minutes to be like, oh, you know, to, to be drifting in, drifting out of real prayer, of real mental prayer and so on and so forth. So it is it is a real commitment. It is. I, and we can we can look at these things and say, you know, if I just say some some prayer each day, because we might be totally out of the habit. Maybe it's 10 minutes of prayer a day, 10 minutes of prayer with just you in silent mental prayer. Uh, that's actually quite a lot if you don't you normally do it. Yeah, especially because it's such high quality time with you and God, just really switching off and being able to fully connect because it's hard. It can be hard to get that headspace in any day. So if you can get 10 minutes every day, you're doing that really could, well. That could be it for you. But also you can examine, you know, what what is it I struggle with exactly uh, when I pray? So how do I how do I address that? What's the best time of the day when I could actually get those those moments? Usually it's the morning. But I know a lot of people don't like the morning. Um, so it could, yeah. it could also be the evening. Well, you know, I've, I'm not a morning person at all. You can ask anyone <laughs> I know, any, any of my family, my friends, especially anyone who's lived with me. I absolutely despise the mornings. But I've found that my prayer is actually best in the mornings because it's like the rest of the day hasn't started. I'm not as distracted by things that have popped up during the day. And I just find my, yeah, my mind is a lot more clear. So if, even if you're not a morning person, I would encourage you to at least try it because I'm telling you, it's been a breakthrough. You're actually story. saying, try the morning. The morning works. Have <laughs> a go does. at morning. <laughs> just in general. <laughs> no, but it really does. I, that's what I found. I know everyone is different. If maybe the evening is better for you, but I would encourage you to try the morning. Yeah. Well, the morning is, is. As, as understood by the rhythm of, of life, of prayer. So we have our, the whole monastic tradition. It's always prayer in the morning. Uh, there, there's also prayer, of course, in the evening. But to start your day and give it to God is a, is a wonderful rhythm of life to be able to get into. Yeah, it really is. 
And I think the the ultimate message here is that inter- internal conversion is absolutely necessary when it comes to any of these things because we can very easily, you know, give up a whole load of things. And unless our internal selves, unless we're actually having a conversion, a turning back to God, because that's where the word conversion comes from, the Latin word converto, which means turn back. So unless we really are turning back to God, there's no point, you know, we're wasting our time unless there's really something deeper happening. Right. And an understanding that this is actually something we must do. Um, And this is where we, again, we're so different from the world. We have to be different from the world that in baptism, you're actually dead to the world. Now, it sounds pretty harsh when you put it that way. But Lent is a time when you're really recognizing that fact and recognizing as well that you are not in and of yourself godly. So when people in the world do Lent, they're trying to kind of, uh, this is a funny word, sublimate themselves, like to be sublime, you know. I'm even going to transition myself into something else. You know, but actually, it's not possible. Uh, you, do, you don't get to do that. What you get to do uh, is to turn to the Lord and put yourself on his mercy. And Lent is a time when you can really, really do that. Exactly. And let him be the one to transform you as well. Remembering that it's a gift uh, that we really have to ask for this you know, internal conversion. Absolutely. Because, you know, you're just not going to be able to do it by yourself. But we also have to have to have... Uh, I think a heart for those around us who don't know this. You know, there is this free gift that God is pouring himself out to us, you know, always looking for us to turn to him. So the more we're able to turn to him and actually be fed by him, I think the better we're going to be able to reach out to those friends we have who do this stuff but don't even know why they do it. Exactly. Well, thank you so much, Dom, for joining us on this episode. It's a pleasure. Thank you for listening to this episode of Know Your Faith. And there's a ton more content available on our website, calledtomore.org. We hope you'll join us for our next episode.